Hi there, I'm Craig Rasmussen, creator and writer of Sojourners, Technopolis, Epoch, and the upcoming Odds and Ends short story anthology available from Zoop. You can find me at monkeygong.com, that's M-O-N-K-E-Y-G-O-N-G, and on social media at Craig Comics, that's K-R-A-I-G-C-O-M-X. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to another episode of Rapid Fire. And we are joined in a one-on-one -on -one style interview with very talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. So who is our guest today? Our guest today is a very talented comic creator. He has at least five comics that I know of, and he's creating an anthology currently right now. We're joined today by the ever-talented Craig Rasmussen. How are you doing today? Doing well, Kurt. You know, thanks for having me. I just want to say that as well. well. Not a problem. Anytime. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I, hopefully I'm bringing the heat to Two Geeks Talking. I'm a science fiction obsessed storyteller basically i just i love to draw i'm totally overwhelmed with the amount of ideas that i have for science fiction worlds it's a genre that i cannot seem to get enough of and there are other genres of comics that i like as well but can't get enough of it and i love to draw so that's pretty much who i am and i'm self-publishing most of my works although i do have some upcoming stuff for uh, some recognizable labels you can see behind me here i actually have my lineup so a few of my books not uh, not quite all of them furthest reaches here is a 50 page science fiction art book that does also have a comic Comic in the middle of it. This is Sojourners here. This is my uh, currently 29-page uh, early edition of a Simeon Space Odyssey. It's Space Monkeys, as you can tell by the cover here, who land on, an, on a mysterious alien planet with mysterious creatures that are somewhat familiar. It's one of my first books where I ever designed an actual creature that doesn't exist. I'm very happy with the way that turned out. And I have Technopolis right here, slightly shorter early edition of a graphic novel that I'm putting together. I'm in the process of inking the full 40 some odd pages of the first book of what's probably going to be a graphic novel trilogy. That's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, this one's all about a sad little kid with a jetpack <laughs> who is obsessed with the mystery of his missing sister. <laughs> And uh, also sort of plagued by being part of a broken family, not from a broken home, but just, you know, families go their separate ways sometimes. And so it's a personal element that I'm exploring with that story. The most recent are these two here. These two were published for the convention season last year. Now what I'm working on for Zoop is the Odds and Ends Anthology. So that will be coming out you know, around June or July. This here is a 2017 edition. It is the first edition of Odds and Ends, and it's the single volume edition. But what I have uh, funding on Zoop currently is actually a double volume edition because when I went to reprint this book in particular, I discovered that I had enough for two books at clocking in at about 100 pages each. So roughly like 88 pages or so of actual sequential art material and then a few supplemental pages as well. But this was a pretty nice graphic novel that I had printed locally in Phoenix where I live. Turned out pretty nice, but as you can see, the you know the binding didn't last and in some cases the glue didn't last. And I only printed 50 copies, so I ran out really fast. Definitely needed to move into uh, figuring out what's do with it beyond that so here's a king david story called kingdom of david in there this is going to have a new life a major name we won't say they're a major publisher but once upon a time they were a major publisher and that is uh that is gold key comics that's somebody that i'm going to be working for starting pretty soon i'm, I'm currently working for them but the, the work will actually see the light of day soon it's sort of well kept secret so far but for those of you who are fans of classic gold key it's coming back and they kept the classic logo so there's some cool stuff happening there. And to get more specific about odds and ends, what you see on the cover here is my time travel character, Dr. Cotton Hickox. It's a weird name for a reason. The Adventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox. You can see here where I mentioned the glue is falling apart in this book. It's my personal copy, so I've been through it a bunch of times to refer to it. But uh, one of the things about this early edition is that I printed some pages in pencil because I was thinking of it as a bit of a like a preview showcase as well as a retrospective. However, when I set out to print a new edition, I realized that I did not want to do that. I really wanted to present everything in ink. I am currently in the process of inking not just this 11-page preview of Dr. Cotton Hickox, but in fact, the entire first issue, which is about 24 pages or so, maybe 25, depending on how I feel about this one scene transition at the very end. It's coming together nicely, but that will be exclusively available inside Volume 2 of the new Odds and Ends. You can see here that he does meet the dark version of himself. And I, I would like to emphasize that I was doing 
the multiverse thing a long time before the multiverse fad that's happening right now. But I will freely admit as well that I'm actually pumping the brakes on trying to publish that story as avidly as I wanted to. I really wanted that to be a big thing that came out this year, but I'm probably only going to release that first issue. And then I have a separate adventure. That's the Adventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox will be the main graphic novel. But then there's the Misadventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox, which will be probably a 10-ish issue maxi series that I'm going to release that's going to be kind of in between a couple of the time trips in, in the actual main story. There were too many ideas for things I wanted to do with the character, but when I was trying to actually put the, the overall story together, I couldn't fit a thing with dinosaurs into the actual you know arc of the graphic novel itself. So I decided to just spin it off. He's basically more or less lost in time. And I don't really want to give that much of the story away yet when it's time. When this book actually drops, I will probably try to make the rounds doing some PR for the specifics of the story. I'm really, really happy with that character. And I've been nursing that story for a very long time. I came up with it in 2001 originally. Then I had to catch up to the idea with my art skills. Over time, I've been shaping the actual character arcs and the plot and things like that, trying to make sure it was as trippy as possible, but also the best possible art that I could deliver. Bring it full circle to odds and ends. It was a bit of a retrospective, but what I'm really trying to do is create a new art experience out of it. In addition to the Cotton Hickox pages that are being inked, I also had a, one other section that was an Alice in Wonderland adaptation. There's a short chunk of it that was in pencil as well, but I'm actually going to ink that as well. And uh, there will be nothing in pencil. Like I said, I just want to emphasize that to anybody that is questioning that element of the original edition. I think it's going to be a pretty dense and interesting book that's largely populated by science fiction. There are two ancient history stories in it, but because I have a time travel character wedged in there, it allows me to to include other eras freely without betraying my science fiction ethos too much. I love historical epics and period pieces as far as films are concerned, and I love Conan and things like that. I can't not play in that sandbox, that sword and sandals sandbox. Swords and loincloths? I don't know. It... Uh, odds and ends, a loincloth free comic, I will tell you that much. <laughs> I'm not against them, just not for that book. <laughs> I'm wearing one right now, actually. So I'm really glad this is waste up. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to ask that question. Um, oh, I'll freely volunteer it, no problem. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Do you? I, I, I was an art model, so it really doesn't surprise me at this point in time. So, oh, um, fair enough. What's the most misunderstood aspect about sci-fi that maybe people who aren't a fan of the genre don't understand? I think the most misunderstood element of sci-fi is actually when it's more like sci-fi fantasy, when it's more like Star Wars or something, where it's not grounded in specific themes or specific social commentary or commentary on the human condition. Because when you really look at science fiction, there's a reason there's a conversation about speculative fiction versus hard science fiction versus sci-fi versus sci-fi fantasy. You can see the splint happening if you start to get really into the minutia of science fiction. When you're talking about, you know, your Harlan Ellison's versus your Ray Bradbury's, Ray Bradbury didn't really care. No salt on Ray Bradbury. I love quite a bit of his writing, actually. But he didn't really care about the science element of it as much as, say, Harlan Ellison did. But Harlan Ellison didn't care as much as Arthur C. Clarke did. There are separations in that element of science fiction as a genre. And for me, space monkeys and things like that, I'm definitely into pushing the envelope to the more loose sci-fi part of the bracket. I think I really want to tend as close as I can to things that are scientifically possible. Luckily, physics has been making some pretty big strides in the last last couple of decades to make things seem a lot more possible as far as the fantastic elements of science fiction. But I, I don't like when it's super loose. That's like a, a big misconception, I think, by people who make a lot of TV science fiction and comics has a, a science fiction-esque quality to it. But then, you know, if you're talking about superheroes or whatever, stuff just kind of gets off the rails as far as being believable. And you have to put yourself in that suspension of disbelief place far, far harder than you do with something, say, like RoboCop, where it's kind of like, oh, I can actually kind of see, you know, evil mega corp coming up with something like RoboCop and being like, well, you know, like, like the actual cops don't matter, but as long as we have somebody, something patrolling the streets, you know, that resembles human. I mean, I don't know. You could just look at the AI art thing. It's, and no corporation really seems to care about the human element being lost. They just want the progress element. So anytime you see something like that, it's not just believable, but it's kind of chilling. And it doesn't have to be chilling. It can be reassuring. It can be, you know, hopeful and optimistic, but it's easier right now to go the chilling direction because the way our society is structured. While the originality factor of it is not not there because they're basically taking pre-existing images and they're putting it into whatever they're putting it into. And I'm not going to mention said person's name that has basically been saying, oh, I've done this in six hours and away we go. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a creative person. No, you're really not. You're just taking a concept that a computer has generated. You're stealing yep. artwork from people that have actually done the time and 
experienced it and put the pain into their artwork, making their lines correct and finding their own style. And you're just saying, yep, I'm a creative person. I'll say it. You're just playing a video game. That's all you're doing. And, you know, if you want to call yourself an artist, that's up to you and your conscience later on when you realize what this is. I'm not saying it's doing anything to the industry. It is definitely going to hurt people who do a more digital style of art because it's so close to what people can produce with Photoshop. Some of the people I know who work on concept design and stuff like that, they are definitely under threat or people who do magazine illustration or book covers, things like that. Those are under threat. But I think I feel fortunate to be a comic book creator because I'm just leaning into the more one-of-a-kind self-expression element of it and the stories are a huge component of that. I'm definitely worried. Don't get me wrong. There's there's a lot of freelance stuff that is probably not going to be in my grasp or anybody else's grasp very near future because of the AI art thing. But luckily that class action lawsuit is happening and I hope that has some kind of an effect on leveling the fairness aspect of the playing field. But we'll see. For those that are new to sci-fi, who are five authors, male or female, that beginning person in sci-fi should read? I'd say uh, Ursula K. Le Guin and Octavia Butler and Nettie Okafor as far as women. And I would say Arthur C. Clarke. It's a tough list. It's a tough list. I love Arthur C. Clarke quite a bit. I think as much as I said, he doesn't care about the science element as much. Ray Bradbury does something with the human side of his science fiction and the, and the mood of his science fiction. He's constantly trying to say something about, you know, what it is to be human in a fantastic setting. So, uh, those are all pretty strong. And Nnedi Okafor is a, is a newer writer who wrote a series of books uh, called, one of them is called Binti, and she has related books. She's currently working on a handful of comics as well. And I have not been blown away by the first novel from someone so hard as I was by hers. The Binti book, which is like a prequel, I believe, with just a mind-blowingly great piece of science fiction. And Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin, those are kind of classic science fiction writers. One new and four classics for you. Arthur C. Clarke's fun because he was a scientist himself. So there's a lot of elements of his stories that are just very true in a lot of weird ways. Like the echoes of current society are pretty fun in his work, even if he missed the mark by just a little bit. Like the prognostication level is very, very high and very strong. Is The Odds and Ends currently running on Zoop? Yeah, it's currently running on Zoop. It's on, on, only on day three at the time of this recording. And uh, we are past two thirds funded. Looking forward to uh, getting that last third in the bank, so to speak. I have a pretty good stretch goal. I was telling you that I'm, you know, I'm inking anything that was unfinished in the pre edition, but the, one of the stretch goals is to actually color the entire book. I'm kind of hoping we can get a grand or two past the goal so that I can actually afford to perhaps hire a colorist or at least just take the time away from freelance to color the whole thing myself. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice? Or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your creative career? Well, and actually a piece of advice that my mom gave me, uh, which is maybe not a surprise. I don't know. Our parents are often the ones that give us advice, but I feel like when I was in art school is when she told me this, when I was going to the Academy of Art and I was just absolutely stressing about the level of complexity of a couple of different projects. There was a ton of homework at that class, like 70 hours or something of homework a week, way more than was comfortable, constantly doing assignments outside of class. And then I had like six hour classes that were very labor intensive. I was very overwhelmed one day and she said, you know, it took me a while to learn this in life, but one of the strongest things that I have learned how to do to become successful with what I set out to do is to take large, intimidating tasks and break them down into small, attainable goals and tasks. That, to me, applies so specifically to comic books above it every other kind of art that I do, but also to art because comics are a long haul where you're kind of by yourself, especially if you're writing and drawing the whole thing. You're left to your own devices for a very long time trying to see this thing through. And it can be very, very daunting. It can be very, very rigorous. You know, you have to make a lot of changes. You know, you get stuff done to a certain extent that you think is done. And then all of a sudden it's not done. And you realize you have to redraw something or rework a section, all that stuff. If you're looking at it ahead of time, it is incredibly intimidating and it can keep you frozen and never starting your work. That piece of advice has stuck with me and I refer to it all the time because I still, no matter how old I get or how many panels I get drawn, I'm still frankly a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of work that goes into a comic, especially when I come up with a concept because my concepts are never simple. I'm definitely cursed with that type of story brain where I just really want to push the envelope. Love to be able to come up with just a single character in a single four wall space. and It's a very easy story to tell, but I doubt that's ever going to happen. I always just want to put more into it. I want it to look better, look more densely packed with detail. I want it to thematically resonate. There's always too many elements going on. So that's a great piece of advice that's really stuck. 
What is your creative kryptonite? Creative self-confidence has been a really big issue for me. I'm, I'm being very open about it all of a sudden. It's like a thing that I've let plague me a lot. And I think that that is sort of tied to another thing that could be considered its own kryptonite. But I'm, I'm realizing that they are so intertwined that I don't know where one ends and where one begins. And that is inertia. I'm very momentum-based as a creator. You know, weeks like this, I've been super busy this week because of the campaign launch and just on social media far more than I am comfortable with as far as the time I'm spending because I'm very momentum-based as a creator, I haven't really had that much time to be at the desk drawing new stuff. And it's really hard for me to get into my groove. I think that when I'm in my groove, I feel like the quality of my work and just the overall flair of inspiration is so visible versus when I'm just at the desk trying to get some work done. I'm not sure that I understood how much momentum was important to me. I used to just really want to get in the groove, find the zone, so to speak. But now I've realized that all the times where I resisted working because I wasn't in the zone. All I was doing was ignoring the fact that my work was reaching a quality that I actually liked when I was in the zone. You know, I wasn't able to see the quality that I'm happy with. Like, I'm very, very happy with my work all of a sudden lately. And I know it sounds really weird, I suppose, but maybe there's somebody out there that can relate. Just I couldn't recognize my work for what it was. And then somewhat recently, I just, you know, especially doing a bunch of conventions last year, I just put everything that was finished in ink and portfolios and was taking original art around to sell it. And I was like, wow, I've got a lot of work here that I'm really happy with. And I'm definitely happy to present this to people. What is my problem? You know, once I kind of put those pieces together, I was like, yeah, I struggle with my confidence. And that is largely, I think, due to that sense of inertia, that need to be in some groove of momentum. And, you know, I spent a lot of time watching movies and TV shows and playing video games because I wasn't in the zone, but I didn't realize how easy it was to find that momentum if I would just figure out how to defeat the inertia side of it. Just get started, get to work, make your thing, finish what you can and then look at it in retrospect and realize, hey, I'm actually kind of happy with what I finished because I managed to finish. It. Like I said, it's all intertwined between those two issues. That has been my biggest kryptonite for years. I get really upset <laughs> sometimes when I feel like it's creeping back in. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Issuing some of the actual artistic influences as far as my career as a comic book creator, one of the biggest influences, and he probably doesn't even realize this because it was just a convention conversation that lasted five minutes. Carl Potts of Alien Legion fame, Punisher Warzone fame. I mean, the guy was huge in the 80s and 90s. Doesn't work quite as much. I talked to him at some point 10 years ago, and I was just coming out of art school, and I was really struggling to get attention from publishers. I was just getting turned down left and right, and I could not get the time of day. Some of these publishers are still friends of mine, but they were brutally honest. Not quite what we're looking for. Probably need to go back to your thumbnails a little bit longer. You need to be a little bit faster. That was part of the problem for sure. And Carl Potts was one of the first people that didn't tell me, well, you need to read comics in sequential art or in understanding comics, read Bern Hogarth's anatomy books. But he didn't make me go back to the drawing board with anything. He looked at my work, talked to me about the rule of threes and panels and to stop putting my focal point in the center of the panel. I mean, he, was, he got super specific, like an art class criticism. This is working for me. This is not. This is how you get past the part that's not working. I go back to that conversation all the time, especially now that I'm art coaching for other creators. I'm constantly I'm like, listen, rule of threes, don't put your focal point in the middle of the panel, spend a little more time on your thumbnails. It was very simple advice, very brief. It was confidence instilling as opposed to being just kind of like waved off. That's one of the big problems with talking to people at conventions, especially publishers, is they just don't have the time to talk to you. I'm understanding that a lot more now because I did a ton of conventions last year. I barely even have time to do a sketch. I can't talk to somebody about their work and people, they kindly want to come up and want to show you their work because they're proud of it. They also want some help with the direction they're heading. Him taking the time and getting super specific with my work, it meant a lot to me. It made me feel more like a peer, you know, and more like a, a part of the comics community than I think any of those conversations, even with some of the publishers and editors that I'm still friends with to this day, they kind of made me feel like I wasn't part of the industry yet. Whereas Carl clearly felt like I had something to offer comics and wanted to make sure that I got there. I just will never forget that. I really appreciate it. And I also, not because of that necessarily, I loved Alien Legion, but I felt so good because of that conversation that I bought every Alien Legion book on this table. And to this day, I still have them all signed and they sit in a place of honor. And thanks, Carl. I don't think Todd McFarlane was as nice to me as I had hoped when I was a kid, when I met him, but then I'm like, okay, but I was just some dumb kid at the time, you know, and he was, 
doing like the first run of spawn it's absolutely a superstar and like doesn't have time for my bullshit you know so it, it makes sense like i'm not taking anything personally so when somebody takes the time to give the personal touch it really means a lot from a professional standpoint you've created multiple comic books you have a campaign currently on zoop in regards to odds and ends so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful Maso menos like i said i've got my struggles like most people do i'm a work in progress like every human being, I think. I would like to be more consistent. And that's definitely been a thorn in my side as far as being more consistent with my happiness. Honestly, I got my nutrition under control recently where I just count my calories and all that really irritating <laughs> minutia. It has, it has helped my consistency so much as far as my mood is concerned. And it's helped my consistency as a creator a lot. I feel like I'm just now starting to make progress as a, like a real adult human being, <laughs> you know? Yeah, maso menos, you know what I mean? More or less in Spanish. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot you're up north where French is more of the uh, lingua franca, specifically, literally. <laughs> We're all just human. It doesn't have a single definition because humans are very complicated and it's tough to be human. That's what the human condition is referring to. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Failure is a big one for me. And actually, the time travel story, Dr. Cotton Hickox, the main theme is failure in that story. Because for me, when I fail at something... I mean, you have to recognize that you're failing. You can't just kind of like blow stuff off and act like things worked out because that is a headspace that people can get in. When you recognize that something is a failure, especially if you're perfectionist, it's easier to recognize a failure. But when I do fail at something, I try to learn the lesson as fast as possible, as permanently as possible, and as deeply as possible. I just figure out what it is I did wrong. I figure out how to defeat that failure in that specific way the next time, really take it to heart on all levels because sometimes there's a lesson that's multi-layered. And for me, the multi-layered element of lessons has definitely been tricky because I would prefer to just download the whole lesson and be like, I got it. But then you realize later, oh, well, there's shades of truth to this or there's a subtlety here that I didn't recognize or my attitude was not allowing me to be clear about what the lesson was. I saw that it was a failure, but I didn't really fully understand it. I think for me, it's just, you got to find the lesson. Honestly, it's a really quick way to recover from failure because the minute that you can look at something as a lesson, the faster you can move on and start building on that. The lesson is the building blocks. The younger generation is looking at your work and they become inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's just a comic writer or an artist or something creative, who knows what the case may be in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I had kind of a long answer to this. I'm kind of glad you sent me the questions ahead of time. I've never had that before on a podcast. And my answer is this. Don't be gatekeepy, elitist, or judgy about their loves or their abilities or their desired goals. And this is the people that are, that are hoping to be inspired by you. Just encourage and help them refine and attain their goals however possible. Just be a productive member of their life. Don't be a naysayer. Don't be discouraging. It, it makes a huge impact on someone when you're discouraging, and it makes an equally huge impact when you're encouraging. And if you help people, like I said with Carl Potts, if you help people get where they're trying to go... They will never forget you. If you try to keep people from getting where they're trying to go, they will also never forget you. But that's a grudge. And that's the thing you don't want. You don't want somebody to be in a position where you maybe could collaborate with them down the road and have them be like, no, nah, I don't like that person. That person did me wrong at some point and I don't like them or their work because of it. And I mean, it can literally have a negative impact on what can be really great work that you produce. People could absolutely hate your work because of who you are to them specifically. There's plenty of examples in pop culture. I won't name anything, but we all kind of know that there are people out there is like, yeah, I mean, I, that's a pretty good movie, but I don't like so-and-so. You just never want to put yourself in a position where that's a potential. You just really want to be as productive as possible in contributing to somebody's future. If your life was a comic book or a film, whatever the case may be, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Well, I've always heard William Dozier from the Batman 66 TV show narrating my life. What's this? A dastardly trap for our hero? You know, like I literally walk into a situation and it's just like, especially if it's some sort of misadventure of some kind, I'm like, oh my God, there's the voiceover coming in, coming in hot. The music would have to be the Carmina Burana, like completely the most epic thing you've ever heard in your life, obviously, clearly. That's totally me. Either that or some really cheesy guitar riff from the 90s. But uh, God, what would the title be? I don't know. Wow, God, that's a, it's a stumper. 
coming up with a good title off the, you know I'm, so, I'm a perfectionist Kurt it's really hard to come up with a good title just in one thought my life has a cartoon character in human form well Craig I do hate <laughs> to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking I want to thank you so much for coming on the show thank you so much for having me Kurt I wish I gave you a better final answer but uh, we'll make do with that this has been great I appreciate the questions they're really fun before I let you go where can we find you how can we support you and of course where can we find the campaign for your uh, crowdfunding. You can find the campaign on Zoop. That's Zoop, uh, zoop.gg slash C slash odds and ends, all one word, um, or just search odds and ends on Zoop. Um, you can find me on social media at Craig Comics. That's K-R-A-I-G-C-O-M-X. And you can find me through my site, monkeygong.com. That's M-O-N-K-E-Y-G-O-N-G. And uh, all my comics are available on Monkey Gong, with the exception of the Odds and Ends anthologies, which are exclusively available through Zoop, unless I have uh, an overage of printing that I can actually put in my shop down the road. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You could, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person. Please give me a break. That's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is back after 14 years, thanks to it being deleted off of another website. And I'm slowly updating the old archive from 2008 on, but currently 2002's interviews are all posted and available on twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And it's available on all streaming services except Apple iTunes because technology. Anyhow. And as I say every <laughs> week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thanks very much. <laughs>